you could go get you guys could go get a comfy chair from over there and then bring it over here. No, you're gonna sit in metal chairs the entire time. Or, all right. I see where my position is here. Counseling at Oak Hills Christian College. Uh, I, I'm still in youth ministry. I volunteered to do a little youth group at a Lutheran church here in town because I couldn't quit, I guess. And so I'm still doing that as well as teaching at Oak Hills. It's kind of fun. So I'm still involved and we're in for a lot of stuff today. So what I want to do, we're going to talk about mental health issues and uh, issues of, of young people. So we're going to kind of go through a lot of things pretty fast in the beginning. Because what I'm looking to kind of create here is a look at how so many things in our society that seem kind of trivial can impact young people's mental health. And so we're going to look through that. So some of you guys, Bill and Jean, you've been in my class. Chris was a graduate, so we've got two guys in my program back here. No, you're in there. You're still in the camping. That's close enough. Mm -hmm. Melissa, you were at Hill. Sarah, I remember you. So like, lots of people who have probably heard some of this before. Josiah, are you back here? You're yeah. in my youth group. <laughs> yep. okay. So crazy. Before, before Sarah was there. So... That's so awesome. I wanted to strive with you a couple times, too. <laughs> they, they do grow up in youth ministry. He's now a pastor. So that's kind of fun. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> still growing up and still a pastor, last I heard. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for a chance we have to uh, come together and just uh, learn from each other and to uh, be reminded of how really a cool opportunity it is, it is to uh, work with young people. May you uh, give us wisdom. May you give us insight into some of the issues they face. Help us to be there to meet their needs. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So here, here we go. Growing up is hard. The session's over. <laughs> it really doesn't that say it? It really is. So we're going to look at some of the reasons why growing up is hard. And uh, I don't know if, well, we all say that when we grow up, we would never want to be a teen again, right? Really? It's so true. But yet, at the same point, we have a love for those people that we want to help them get through it. Maybe because we did. Or maybe because this is a weird gift we have or something, I don't know. But we're still doing it. So this is an academic definition of adolescence, which is the time period we're looking at. And I got two for you. One's academic, one's fun. Adolescence is a psychosocial independent search. I like the word search. Uh, for a unique identity or separateness, with the end goal being a certain knowledge of which who one is in relation to others, a willingness to take responsibility for who one is becoming, and a realized commitment to live with others in the community. Makes sense. It's a process, it's a journey. Uh, I like the word search, again, because we're trying to figure out who we are. Uh, one, some authors, uh, less and less, wrote a book called Helping Your Struggling Teenager, and they talk about the search for identity as trying on a new set of clothes every other day. One day you're a skateboarder, the next day you're a show choir, another day you're playing football. And if one fits, you keep it. So that's kind of what they're going through. Um, here's my favorite definitions, uh, the last one especially. But adolescence begins in biology with puberty, and it ends in culture. Okay? The last one's good. Adolescence begins with the onset of puberty and ends sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so we can argue that some have not gotten there yet, or are working with young people possibly. Or some of us never quite get out of it. <laughs> so here's a good one. The trouble with you kids these days is you're spoiled. Everything is made too easy for you. In my day, we were really had it rough. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of fun. So adolescence is kind of a cultural phenomenon. About a hundred years ago, we didn't really have it. You kind of grew up, maybe in an agrarian society, worked on the farm, you quit school, maybe sixth grade, eighth grade, if you got that far, and you worked. You got married, had a family, and you continued on the farm. There was youth, but no adolescence. So this is kind of something that's kind of come more recently. Here's kind of how I look. If we think about middle school, high school, and college, that's kind of a good way of classifying adolescence. We have early, middle, and late. And those are the groups we're looking at. They all have unique needs, and they're fun people. But they're transitioning from this time frame of, of uh, a child to an adult. And it could take as long as 15 years. It's a long time to keep certain instincts, certain things in check. So in contemporary societies may even be extended by grad school, not being able to get your first job, economic stress, you're living at home, and so forth. 
So, here we go. Uh, yeah, 15 years or more, the reality is both. So we got, I forget which movie that is in the floor left, but right here, Fox News did a study, and 40% of young adults are living with their parents. So a lot of people. I get it. So, this is another way of looking at it. We're not getting the full slide, Timmy. There's a third line there. Uh, see if you can kind of cramp that down a bit. Up. The first, the, these are three tasks of adolescence that we need to discover in those three sections, the early, middle, and late. The first one is being, which is middle school. The question is, there's a question of identity, and it's the answer to who am I? Make sense? They're trying to figure things out. They're kind of doing all kinds of wild stuff, trying to figure out who they are. The, the second level was more high school, and that's trying to belong. Now think about your high school students. They're trying to fit in. They're trying to find a group to belong with. They're trying all kinds of things to figure out who they are. They kind of asked the question, do I matter? What's my unique contribution? And we're not getting that last slide here. The third one is uh, becoming. Is it showing up at all? Okay. All right, we'll have to see what we can work with that. The, the third was becoming, and that has to be with the questions about uh, where do I fit, if I remember correctly. So that's, that kind of helps us get a picture of what we're working with. So middle school, being, who am I? High school, belonging, where do I, kinda, where do I fit, do I matter? And do I have any power, anything unique to contribute to this world? And the last one, becoming, what am I becoming as we work through those college years and into adulthood? So we've evolved to a point now that many authors are saying this, we believe driving is support, being active is love, providing any and every opportunity is selfless in nature. Now there's something missing here. We're providing, but we're not relating, okay? So we, we are a culture that has forgotten how to be together. I think that's really key in looking at mental health issues of our young people. So too many few, too few adults take time to guide their children, their young people, the people they have opportunity to speak into, into uh, adulthood. A lot of young people then just simply feel abandoned by the adults, by people who care. They do care, but sometimes things get in the way. So the adolescent journey is, begins, it's, uh, it's lengthened because no one's available. It's also, they kind of have the sense that they, they're, they're not, there's not a realistic sense of what they're preparing for. We've lost our, our focus. Back in the days when you knew you had to get a job, you had to take care of the farm, and so forth, you knew what you're doing. Now it's like, well, what do I do? I'm going to be a professional athlete, or I'm going to do this or that, and it takes longer to figure it out. So the more we leave kids alone, this is Patricia Hurst in a book called uh, Tribe Apart, the more we leave kids alone, don't engage, the more they circle around on the same adolescent logic that has caused dangerous situations to escalate. Now, you ever watched a bunch of junior high boys? <laughs> They kind of lower themselves to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> Pretty entertaining, but it's not always good. <laughs> so we want to kind of help them figure it out. So this is a book that I use in my classes that I want to go through just briefly. And we're going to talk about just key areas of the book, but we can't do it all. It's too much. But I want you to get a picture here. It's called Hurt to 2.0 by Chad Clark out of Fuller Theological Seminary. And what he said, he spent one year in a high school just talking to young people, kind of being part of the crew, being part of the teachers here, and he began to understand them. It's a few years old, but I don't see much change. Billie Jean, when you were in the class, we look at this, you actually talk with all your grandchildren, nieces and nephews, and they say, yeah, that's it. So we're gonna look at that. Peers, here's how they see peers. Today's high schools are populated by smaller groups of friends or cluster groups. What happened is these cluster groups, however they might be, whether it be skaters, school, school kids, nerds, whatever you want to call them, that's their family. That's where they fit. They also are there more often than the family. So that's one way to kind of feel like they belong. Okay? This provides safety, a cohesive unit. It allows them to find a safe place. Maybe there's not one at home. We all know many children and young people who don't have a safe home, but they're safe there, at least they think so. And they believe they have no choice but to find that group and be a part of it. Okay? They call all night, they text all night, they don't get sleep because their phones are waking up, and they hang out with them whenever they can. School. Instead of fostering uh, in students like traits of honesty, integrity, cooperation, respect, the school may be promoting deception, hostility, and anxiety. We don't like to see that. I don't think we're trying to. 
But sometimes the competition that happens in schools to get good grades, to get that great um, scholarship or whatever kind of takes over here. This is from a lady named Denise Clark Pope about a, in a book called Doing School. The views from teachers are that learning should be enough. Our teaching is great stuff. I've got trigonometry to give you today. I love it. You should love it too. Well, the kids don't see it that way. And also sometimes teachers pigeonhole people in a certain spots. Not on purpose, but they kind of, it might be that relationship of who's interested, who's not, who I like, where they come from in some sense. But teachers, as a result of all these expectations put upon them, feel overburdened, overwhelmed. They have to teach to the test sometimes. I hear that often from our teachers. And they can't relate to the young people. They can't care about people like they thought they were going to when they went into the profession. Okay? Um, so students who care about grades and academic performance are, are experimenting in increasing levels of anxiety and stress. So you see a pattern beginning here? All these things are going to show us two big things. Anxiety and probably depression are two big things our young people face every day in increasing amounts. How do we help them with that? That's what we're going to look at today. So successful students learn to devise strategies to get through it. Some of those involve cheating. Family. The definition of family has changed, or marriage has changed. Uh, the old one was just simply two or more persons related by birth, marriage, or adoption who reside in the same household. That's changed a bit. Uh, you can't see the bottom slide, but I have three different people from uh, who have written books talking about how they see family. In a nutshell, it's this. Two people who love each other for as long as they want to in the same house, maybe. It's along those lines. That doesn't really provide stability for young people. And if you talk to young people, what they're going to tell you is that I want a relationship with my family, but I don't know who it is. And sometimes you hear things, too, that, but if it's going to cause me more grief, I don't want it. So they're struggling. Somehow they innately want a mom and a dad. Who cares? Who's there? So the overwhelming data regarding the influence of parents on a child still is out there. It's telling us that they are looking for safety a supportive dual parent in a, in, a, in a dual parent setting. Interesting. That's what they want, but we have thought we know, we know better sometimes as adults. So it spills over and affects all the people in the family. This changing definition affects adolescence. Sports, this is the one I don't like, because I played sports all through high school and college. But there's some interesting things here, and we won't be surprised. Coaches and parents have added a layer of performance anxiety to the love of sport. How? Got to win. Got to practice every day. You can't go on vacation. We practice the day after Christmas. Our children, my oldest was in a, a locomotive here in the high school when he was there. And we came here from Kansas many, many years ago. And I remember uh, they were going to have a practice for locomotive like the day after Christmas or not too far after. And in the meeting I said, Mr. Fedek, we won't be back in time. We have to travel 12 hours just to get to our family. I don't want to turn around the next day and come back. Can you move it? And about that time, several other parents said, yes, please. We, want, we, we have to travel six or four. So I, I think there's some, there's some uh, collaborating that can occur. We have to approach it. They're looking out for the best of their teams. I get that. I'm looking out for my children. Uh, putting Families First, a book from the University of Minnesota, Dr. Dottery. It's a very good book about writing, this is where a community outside of Minneapolis came together to the school board and said, look, we love what you're doing for our children, but we want them, they're ours, we'll loan them to you, let's work together here. We want family dinners, we want holidays, we want some things together. Uh, this is Chad Clark, the author, saying this, we still use the rhetoric of, youth, of that sports build character, yet in reality we've taught that it builds nothing more than arrogance, self-centeredness, and a performance ethic that is destructive to you to healthy, communally connected development. I don't like that, but I get it. Sex, this is fascinating. <laughs> Teens, come on. Teen, one thing is that because it's so prevalent in our society, the attitude teens have towards sex is tainted. It's not all cracked up to be, okay? Another thing here is that uh, they use sexuality and sensuality to connect. Not to love, not for anything sacred, but to connect and stay, have a friend. It's a sad reality that they're using it for. So there's another level of anxiety, of pressure, of 
depression if something breaks up. Imagine if you break up after you've been dating someone for a long time, and now you've got a sexual experience alongside that. The breakup is deeper. It's also deeper uh, neurotransmitter-wise in the brain. So Clark states that we are becoming aware, he's becoming aware, that what adolescents are really missing here is not sex, they're using it to not feel lonely. Wow. So loneliness is a key issue here. It's a salve for the pain and the feelings of abandonment. Uh, Chad Clark's big words here in this book are systematic abandonment. Our society is gradually, slowly, systematically abandoning our young people to other people, other programs, other places. And he's saying, we as parents need to step in. And I think, as youth pastors, need to step in and help the family survive. Amen. Dizziness and stress. Well, we know they're youth busy. This book is from the 80s. Okay? Now, it's still here. It's not gotten, it's gotten worse. David L. Cameron wrote a book called The Hurry Child. His, his conclusion was that stress, stress born of rapid, bewildering social change and constantly rising expectations has made young people the victims of overwhelming stress in the 80s. Now, we're going to cover this later on. How have cell phones added to that? Internet addiction. It's bigger, okay? So uh, here's a good one. Uh, we need to investigate the possibility of some of the aspects of our culture, uh, such as materialism, always being able to buy something, slide your right finger to, or your thumb to the right on Amazon, it's coming to your house tomorrow. Okay? Kind of fun, but kind of cool. And uh, perfectionism, individualism, competition, all those things are part of it. So, all right, so we're going to kind of skip through here and kind of hit the high points. Ethics, morality, cheating's rampant. But they don't see it as cheating. Here's what they say. If it doesn't really hurt anybody and it's necessary for any reason, a white lie is not really a lie. It's just that uh, it's not wrong. I have to do it. They're blaming others for those kinds of things. It's an adaptation to daily living. Parenting styles, that can affect a lot. Anybody teach in the schools? Oh, okay. Parent teacher seminars conferences can be really wild. What do you mean you're not teaching my kid anything? What's wrong with you? Okay, here's a couple things. The tablet is a new pacifier, these are the parenting styles. Uh, the baby monitor is a new babysitter. Netflix is the new playground. Don't go out and play, just turn on a video. Fortnite is a new pickup game. So the basketball, baseball, you can go play Fortnite and connect with people online. Uh, Instagram is a new photo album. Interesting stuff. There's a good one down there, but I can't see it, guys. Uh, anyway. So these are four parenting styles that can be dangerous too. The preoccupied, distracted parent, they're on Facebook or tablets or being distracted by things today. Uh, I have a picture you sh you'll see quickly that shows a family sitting around the table all on their tablets. It happens more than you think. Okay? The paranoid or distrustful parent, they micromanage the kids. Uh, they're overly cautious. We, they're, they're saying that this generation is the safest generation ever, but they can't risk anything. They don't know how. I'm scared. They're walking around in bubble suits. The passing or a docile child, or parent I mean, they're overwhelmed by the kids' issues and they don't know what to do. And then we have our pandering, defenseless parents, they just don't have a backbone. Whatever. Those can impact our young people too, which creates more stress, more anxiety, more depression because young people need some boundaries. Boundaries tell us for love, it keeps us safe. Social media, here it comes. This is Look at the pictures there. Look at the lady on the swing. There's actual video on YouTube that you can watch. I don't know how it's contrived, but it's of a of a couple who set up a deal with the police in the area, and they've got a dad at the park with his child playing on the playground, and uh, the dad's on the cell phone, and the couple comes in and they offer candy to take the kid. And then later on, uh, they this dad's looking around trying to figure out what's going on, and they come back and they say, hey, did, were you keeping an eye on him? What's going on? And they kind of talk about the dangers of social media being connected or addicted, possibly, to your phone can have dire consequences. Uh, stats. 73% of 37,000 respondents claim that mobile phones are the most of the electronic device they use the most. Makes sense? It's a computer in your hand. It's more powerful than the old laptops we used to have. I mean, the old desktops and all that. Most people check their phone about 80 times a day, or almost 2,400 times a month, resulting in 30,000 times. 
Now, you can get an app on your phone to tell you whether your usage is up or down. It's kind of fun to watch. It's worth looking into. It has become our mailbox, our TV, our teacher, our consultant, our photo the album, our newspaper, our radio, our map, road map, our wristwatch, camera, board game, library, and the party line. According to the Pew Research Center, uh, the young people, college students, put it in the same category as air and water. I can't do it without my phone. A lot of young people sleep with it next to their bed, which means a couple things. They're never tuned out. They're always on. They hear it all night. And the other thing is, and is that if they're being bullied, the bully comes home with them. And the bully's right next to them all day. They can't turn it off. They can't, they can't be safe at home. So that might be a good reason why some cell phones should be placed in the central place of the home. Same with laptops and tablets. Uh, look at the second one down here. Neuroscientists have created the term continuous partial attention in response to the constant attention-seeking demands of our phones. You ever done that? It feels like it's buzzing, but you don't even have it in your pocket. Or, or you just, there's a commercial on TV that's a cell phone ringing, and I often think, oh, man, I've got to check my phone. It's on the TV instead, but it just, we're so used to that. We're kind of constantly being uh, programmed. Emerging terms. Now, I underline the word fear here for a reason. We're talking about fears, anxiety, depression, those kind of things that come out from this, this particular age group. So here's our new terms that have come out as a result of cell phones, tablets, and those kind of things. FOMO, the fear of missing out. Big one. What if they, had this, they went without me? I can't handle that. FOMU, fear of messing up. Anxiety, test-driven, performance-based. FOJO, fear of judgment online, the bullies. Pictures may be sent that weren't supposed to be sent. Femoral, the fear of meeting in real life, which could be from dating, could be from other things, could be from whatever. Um, fubbing, which is snubbing others with phone use. There was a picture back there of a couple in bed turning back to back, looking at their phone. That's, that's fubbing. Okay? And then in response to that, we have the Jomo challenge. The joy of missing out or purposely tuning in for something better. Kind of fun. Joy of missing out. So let's chill, let's get away from this. Okay? Uh, in a LinkedIn article, we found that a lot of companies now have begun to take steps to have people in their employment be disconnected. They monitor phone use and put them in separate places so that we don't know, uh, they, they can't have access to it. And look at the two major companies who started this. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. They're tracking digital phone use during work. What's happening? So they're non productive. The video will show some of that too. So they'll spend about four hours a day on their social. These are real life cases of people who have been so addicted intimately on the internet to issues that have had, had serious issues. One is uh, uh, internet, internet addiction is in so here in China and Taiwan with the terms digital dope and electronic opium that authorities are calling this a new opium war. 